Hi guys. So today we are going to finish chapter 10. So we're going to talk about action potentials and nerve impulses. So now we're going to talk about how the nervous system works. So we left off introducing the synapse and synaptic transmission. Remember the synapse is the space between the neurons. And remember there are presynaptic neurons, which just means before the synapse. And there are postsynaptic neurons, which means after the synapse and then the synaptic cleft is between them. So synaptic transmission involves a one-way transfer of information. The impulse is gonna travel down the axon of the presynaptic neuron to the axon terminal, which is the end of the neuron. Once the impulse gets there, that's going to trigger a rush of calcium ions into the synaptic knob. That calcium is going to cause the release of a neurotransmitter from the secretory vesicles through exocytosis. So the vesicle is going to bind with the membrane and then release its contents into the synapse. The neurotransmitter is then going to diffuse across the synapse and bind to the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron and either excite it or inhibit it. A cell membrane is usually electrically charged and we call this polarization. The inside of the membrane is negatively charged compared to the outside. This results in an unequal distribution of ions between the inside and the outside of the membrane. And this is an important factor in conduction of impulses in both neurons and muscle fibers. So potassium ions are the major intracellular ion. So that's inside the cell and it's a cation, it's positive. Sodium ions are the major extracellular cation, positive ion, so that's outside the cell. So inside the cell you have more potassium, outside the cell you have more sodium. This distribution is created by the sodium-potassium pump. Once an action potential fires, after it's all over with, the distributions are all off. So the sodium-potassium pump comes in and is going to pump three sodium out of the cell and two potassium into the cell to restore their concentrations. Ion channels are formed by membrane proteins, as hopefully you remember from intro biology, and these are gonna help regulate the passage of ions in and out of the cell. Now, there are a lot of factors that affect the opening and closing, and we're gonna talk about some of them now. First off, resting membrane potential is the potential that the membrane has when the neuron is not being stimulated, so it's at rest. The sodium and potassium ions are going to follow the normal rules of diffusion, so they're going to go down their concentration gradients, so they're going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. The difference between the inside and the outside of the cell measures at about 70 millivolts. So the membrane of the neuron is polarized because it has this charge. Again, more sodium outside the cell, more potassium inside the cell. But inside the cell, along with that extra potassium, there's also more negatively charged ions and proteins. So that's going to give the inside of the cell an overall negative charge compared to the outside of the cell. The resting cell membrane is more permeable to potassium ions than sodium ions. So again, that's going to make the inside of the cell more negative. Resting membrane potential for a typical neuron is negative 70 millivolts because of this unequal distribution of charges. If that changes, the sodium potassium pump comes in to restore it. This is just showing you a neuron. So you have high sodium outside the cell and high potassium inside the cell. So when they go down their concentration gradients, sodium will go into the cell, potassium will go out of the cell. But potassium ions diffuse out faster than sodium ions diffuse in. So that's where that negative charge inside overall results. You have that net loss of the positive charge, so it's negative charge inside. And again, with a voltmeter, it measures at about 70 millivolts, negative 70 millivolts. So the electrical potential difference is negative 70. 
This is going to help sodium diffuse into the cell and it's going to oppose potassium diffusion out of the cell. So more sodium ions are going to enter the cell than potassium leaving the cell. But the sodium potassium pump maintains those balances. Neurons are excitable cells, as we know. They're going to detect stimuli and respond by changing their resting potential. The gated ion channels were open. If the membrane potential becomes more negative, it's said to be hyperpolarized. If it becomes less negative, it's said to be depolarized. And remember, if something is less negative, it's more positive. Local potential changes are graded. Think about it as if you throw a rock into the water. When you throw a rock into the water, the area right around the rock is going to have a lot bigger waves than as you go further away from the rock. So the rock is the stimulus. The greater the stimulus, the intensity, the greater the potential change. So the waves around the rock are going to be stronger right where the rock entered the water, and then they're going to kind of dissipate the further away you get from it. That's what graded potentials are. If the degree of depolarization reaches the threshold potential of negative 55 millivolts, an action potential will fire. So threshold potential is the minimum change that has to be established before an action potential will happen. If we reach threshold, the action potential fires. If we don't reach threshold, it will not. So here's a recording of an action potential. So you have resting potential at about negative 70 millivolts. Then you have the stimulus occurring. If the stimulus is strong enough to cause a change to negative 55 millivolts, depolarization occurs. During depolarization, the sodium gates are open. So sodium is rushing into the cell, causing it to become more positive. Once it reaches its max at about positive 30 millivolts, the sodium gates will close and the potassium gates will open. So potassium is going to start leaving the cell. That's going to cause the cell to repolarize and become more negative. However, those potassium gates are really slow to close. So you have an overshoot called the hyperpolarization where it goes even more negative than it's supposed to be. That's when the sodium potassium pump will come in and reestablish resting membrane potential. So this is just showing you when the sodium channels and potassium channels open or close and what's happening with the threshold. So resting membrane potential again, negative 70 millivolts. The threshold stimulus is negative 55. Once that is hit, sodium channels are open and the membrane depolarizes. Once it gets to about positive 30, the membrane will start to repolarize. There's going to be a brief period of hyperpolarization. It'll hit about negative 90, and then the sodium potassium pump returns it to resting membrane potential by pumping three sodium out and two potassium in. So when the cell is depolarizing, the sodium channels are open, which means the potassium channels are closed. Once it hits that max of positive 30, the sodium channels close and the potassium channels open. But because the potassium channels are really slow to close, you have that brief hyperpolarization. So the sodium potassium pump has to come in and get it back to resting membrane potential. So the axon hillock is the trigger zone. That is where the action potential is going to be triggered. The sodium channels are closed at resting potential, but when threshold is reached, they're going to open up. Sodium ions are going to rush into the cell, causing the membrane to depolarize until it reaches that positive 30 millivolts. Once it reaches there, the sodium channels close, potassium channels open. Potassium ions are going to diffuse out down their concentration gradient, and the membrane is going to repolarize. As the membrane potential drops because those potassium gates close really slowly, we have a temporary hyperpolarization 
until the potassium channels finally close. Active transport with the sodium potassium pump is going to reestablish that resting potential because it's going to pump three sodium out and two potassium in. And then the concentration gradients are going to be maintained as long as the neuron is at rest. This just shows you how the action potential is going to travel down the axon as a nerve impulse. So notice that one section is going to be active and then the next section and then the next section and the next section. This is just a little chart summarizing what happens, which we just talked about. So action potentials are either going to fire or they're not. It's an all or none response. If the neuron responds, it's going to respond all the way. An action potential will fire and then propagate down the axon as a nerve impulse. Whenever threshold intensity is hit, a nerve impulse is going to con be conducted. All impulses carrying an axon are the same strength. You're not going to have a higher axon potential and a lower one. You're going to have the action potential fire or not. But what can happen is if a stimulus is a really high intensity, it can produce a higher frequency of action potentials. So what will happen is the action potentials will occur more often as opposed to being stronger. So you'll have a higher rate of action potentials occurring as opposed to stronger action potentials. So action potentials are all the same strength. It's just a matter of how often they're sent as opposed to strength. Hopefully that makes sense. During an impulse, there is a portion of action actively conducting the action potential, and it's not able to respond to another threshold stimulus. This is called the refractory period. So while it's responding, it can't respond to another stimulus. The refractory period has two parts, the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period. The absolute refractory period is the time where the voltage-gated sodium channels are unresponsive. So the threshold stimulus cannot generate another action potential no matter what happens. So think about it as it's absolute. It can't generate another action potential regardless. The relative refractory period, though, is the period when a high-intensity stimulus can generate another action potential. But it has to be a high-intensity stimulus. So this is when we get more frequency of action potentials occurring. Repolarization is not complete. Membrane, the membrane is reestablishing resting potential, but it's not quite there yet. So the refractory period limits the number of action potentials generated per second. So again, absolute refractory period, no matter what, another action potential is not going to happen. But the relative refractory period, if the stimulus is high enough in intensity, we can generate another action potential. The speed of the impulse is going to vary with myelination. Remember, myelin is that lipid substance that's going to surround the axon, and it's going to act as an electrical insulator. They are white because of the lipid content. Ions can cross the membrane through gaps in the myelin sheath called the nodes of Ranvier, and this is actually going to speed up transmission. Myelinated axons follow saltatory conduction which means that the impulse is going to jump from node to node to node to node. So it makes it a lot faster. So impulse transmission is faster in myelinated axons as compared to unmyelinated axons. Myelinated axons, it jumps from node to node to node. Unmyelinated axons, one section is going to have to be signaled, and then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. So one section will be going through depolarization, and once it starts repolarizing, then the next section will go through depolarization. Once that starts repolarizing, then the next one, and so on. So think about it as if you had a bunch of people lined up, and you're going to pass them a marker, let's say. So you're going to pass each person a marker, 
So by the time it gets to the end, X amount of time has lapsed. Now take out two people so that you only have every third person there. And now you're gonna throw the marker to the person next to you. It's gonna to get to the end a lot quicker simply because there's fewer people that it has to go through. That's just like an axon. If there's fewer areas that the action potential has to go through, it's gonna be faster. It's jumping from node to node to node so myelinated axons are where you took out the people and you only have X amount of people to throw the marker to. Unmyelinated neurons is where everybody's standing next to each other and you have to just keep passing the marker. Hopefully that helps. Axon diameter also affects conduction speeds. Thick axons transmit faster than thin. This is just showing you saltatory conduction. So you're gonna have the action potential jumping from node to node to node. Clinically speaking, there are a lot of factors that impact um, conduction. Changes in the permeability of the axons to certain ions are gonna affect it. For example, if you have an increase in the concentration of potassium in the extracellular fluid, that's going to reduce that potassium gradient so threshold potential will be reached with a lower intensity stimulus. This is going to lead to excitable neurons, which sounds like a good thing, but it can actually lead to convulsions because the neurons are being stimulated too easily. On the other hand, a decrease in the concentration of potassium in the extracellular fluid causes the neurons to become hyperpolarized. Action potentials are not generated and this can actually lead to muscle paralysis. A decrease in the permeability to potassium ions can be caused by some anesthetic drugs. And basically, it's just going to stop the impulse from traveling through the tissue fluid around the axon. Impulses do not reach the brain, so there isn't perception of touch or pain. So with these anesthetic drugs, the impulses don't reach the brain. If they do not reach the brain, you're not going to be able to perceive that pain. Transmission of a nerve impulse from one neuron to another is officially called synaptic transmission. Remember, the axon hillock is going to generate that action potential, and then it's going to travel down the axon as a nerve impulse. Once it gets to the axon terminal, the synaptic knob, you're going to have an influx, that rush of calcium ions. That's going to trigger the secretory vesicles that carry the neurotransmitters to fuse with the membrane and release their contents, the neurotransmitters, through exocytosis. The neurotransmitters are then going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind with the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. Now, depending on the neurotransmitter, the effect can actually be inhibitory by closing ion channels or excitatory by opening ion channels. The gated ion channels are going to respond to the neurotransmitter. Local potentials result from changes in chemically gated ion channels. Those are called synaptic potentials. Excitatory neurotransmitters are going to increase the permeability to sodium ions. That's going to bring the membrane closer to threshold and increase the likelihood of generating an impulse. Inhibitory are the opposite. They move farther from threshold and decrease the likelihood of generating impulses. Excitatory postsynaptic potential. So now we're in the postsynaptic neuron. So the neurotransmitter has diffused across the synaptic cleft and it is binding to the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. The membrane change in which the neurotransmitter opens the sodium channels is excitatory. This is going to depolarize the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron because sodium is going to flood into the axon. The action potential is going to become more likely because you have more sodium to reach threshold much easier. On the other hand, if those neurotransmitters open potassium channels so that they can leave the cell, that's going to be an inhibitory postsynaptic potential that hyperpolarizes the membrane and the action potential is going to be less likely. So EPSPs are excitatory postsynaptic potentials. 
and IPSPs are inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Now you might notice that I repeated a lot of things over and over. That's because they're important. And in order for you to hopefully learn them, the more you hear them, the easier it's going to be to learn. After we finish this lecture, I'm actually going to kind of summarize it all and hopefully that will help too. EPSPs and IPSPs can be added together through a process called summation. Now, depending on which is stronger, they can actually cancel each other out sometimes. A net excitatory effect is going to lead to greater probability of an action potential. A net inhibitory effect is going to lead to action potentials not being generated or they'll be inhibited. Summation of all of the inputs occur at the trigger zone, which as we know, is the axon hillock. There are at least 100 neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is the one that stimulates skeletal muscle contraction at the neuromuscular junction, which the neuromuscular junction is where the axon is going to meet the muscle membrane. Neurotransmitters can be amino acids, peptides, or monoamines. They're produced in the rough ER or the cytoplasm. When the impulse reaches the synaptic knob of the axon, they're going to be released through exocytosis. So the axon, the cell body, sorry, the cell body is going to produce everything that that neuron needs. So the cell body will produce any neurotransmitter that is necessary. These are some charts showing you the neurotransmitters, the big ones that we talk about, where they're at and what they do. So make sure you kind of go through this and familiarize yourself with a few of them because they're going to be important if you go on to nursing school. Here's the amino acids, gases like nitric oxide when they're knocking you out to get dental work done. These are some disorders associated with neurotransmitter imbalances. These are also going to be important. Clinical depression, epilepsy, Huntington's, insomnia, Parkinson's, these are all important. So make sure you just kind of go through them and become familiar with them. You're not necessarily going to need them for your final, but it will be helpful as you go on to nursing school. These are drugs that alter neurotransmitter levels. Talks about the drug itself, what neurotransmitter is affected, how it acts, and the effect. Notice nicotine is on here, nicotine being in cigarettes and vape products. It's going to increase alertness and your sense of pleasure, which is why it's so hard to quit smoking. The nicotine actually have receptors in your brain that it will bind to and make you feel better. So without that, a lot of people will become depressed if they try to quit smoking. So nicotine is a tough one. So if you haven't smoked, don't start. This is just talking about how neurotransmitters are released. So I've talked about this a few times, but here it is in chart format for you. Vesicle trafficking is the process of membrane recycling. So the synaptic vesicle fuses to the cell membrane as it releases its neurotransmitter. And then endocytosis is actually going to return the membrane to the cytoplasm to form new vesicles. So we reuse the synaptic vesicles and will actually form new secretory vesicles, which is kind of cool. Many neurons in the brain or spinal cord make neuropeptides, and some of those act as neurotransmitters. Others act as what are called neuromodulators. And these are substances that alter a neuron's response to a neurotransmitter or completely block the release of a neurotransmitter. And cephalins, for example, relieve pain sensations. Beta endorphins also relieve pain sensation, but these are more potent and longer lasting. Substance P is found in neurons that conduct pain impulses, and encephalins and endorphins actually release, inhibit the release of substance P. The way the nervous system processes impulses and then acts upon them reflects how they're organized. So the brain and the spinal cord have a specific organization in order to process impulses. Action potentials are related to the impulse conduction along an axon because the propagation of that series of action potentials along the nerve fiber 
makes up an impulse. So action potentials are related to impulses because the propagation of the action potential results in the impulse. Neuronal pools are groups of inner neurons. Now remember, inner neurons are the ones in the central nervous system. They make the connection between the sensory and the motor. So inter means between, so between neurons. Cell bodies may be in different parts of the central nervous system. So these inner neurons work together to perform a common function. Each pool receives input from other neurons and then generates output to other neurons. Pools may affect other pools or even peripheral effectors. So remember the effector is what brings about the change. Facilitation occurs if repeated impulses on an excitatory presynaptic neuron cause that neuron to release more neurotransmitter in response to a single impulse. So releasing more neurotransmitter than it should basically is going to increase the likelihood that that postsynaptic neuron is gonna fire. Convergence happens if one neuron receives input from several neurons. Incoming impulses will often represent any information from different types of sensory receptors. So when you have multiple types of sensory receptors converging on one neuron to give them all of their information, basically, the nervous system can collect, process, and respond to all of that information. And it makes it possible for the neuron to sum up the impulses from a bunch of different sources. Divergence is the opposite. One neuron sends impulses to several neurons through branching of its axons. This can actually amplify an impulse. So an impulse from a single neuron can activate several motor units and skeletal muscle. Impulses from a sensory receptor may reach different regions for processing too. Finally, opiates. Opiates, we are in an opiate epidemic we have going on here. More people are overdosing from opiates than ever before. We're talking about morphine, heroin, opium, codeine, things like that. We have opioid regulations now where you have to show your driver's license and everything else to get them. And there's supposed to be checks in place so that we don't have people doctor shopping or going to a bunch of different pharmacies, for example, to get painkillers. But it hasn't really, it's helping obviously, but it hasn't solved the problem. So any opiate drug is derived from the poppy plant. We actually produce opiates called endorphins. Endogenous opiates, though, relieve pain. So during childbirth, for example, acupuncture, the, how you feel good when you exercise. Opiate drugs are useful in relief from severe pain, though. However, the problem is they're very addictive. If you try to stop opiates on your own, oftentimes you go through withdrawal, which can be very bad especially with pain. If you are used to taking opiates, if you have long-term use, they have legitimate uses, obviously. If you are in a car accident, if you rupture discs, I have seven herniated discs myself. So they are useful. But the problem is that addiction is so easy. It's easy for it to happen. So you have to really monitor your opiate intake if you are taking opiates. And then you have to wean yourself off of them. You can't just stop because if you stop, you're going to go through withdrawal. When you take opiates, our body stops producing its own endorphins. So we no longer have that natural pain cure in our bodies. And then when you do not have the opiates, you do not have our own endorphins, so you're going to feel the pain. Oftentimes, you get very sick as well, and sometimes, especially with heroin, you can actually die, so you have to be careful. So just to sum up, an action potential, it will be triggered at the axon hillock. What happens is we have resting membrane potential, about 70, negative 70 millivolts. When a stimulus comes in, if we hit threshold potential, 
which is about negative 55 millivolts, our sodium channels are going to open up. Sodium is going to rush into the cell, causing depolarization. Once we hit about positive 30 millivolts, the sodium channels close and the potassium channels open. That's going to cause potassium to leave the cell. However, potassium channels close slowly. So as the potassium is leaving the cell, our cell is repolarizing and becoming more negative. Because remember, potassium is positively charged. So we're losing all of that potassium, so the inside is now becoming more negative. So we're repolarizing. But because those potassium gates close so slowly, we have that overshoot called hyperpolarization. That's when the sodium-potassium pump will come in and pump three sodium out, two potassium in, in order to restore the resting membrane potential. So that is it for Chapter 10. I truly hope it helps you guys. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Bye.